Please pray with me. Father, I pray that the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts will be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. I love what um, N.T. Wright says about the Bible in one of his books. He said, it's a big book, full of big stories with big characters. They have big ideas and they make big mistakes. It's about God and greed and grace, about life, lust, laughter, and loneliness. It's about birth, beginnings, and betrayal, about siblings, squabbles, and sex, about power and prayer and prison and passion, and that's only Genesis. He's right. He's right. And over the course of the next few couple of months, three months, we're going to be exploring some of those ideas as we make our way through the book of Genesis. Obviously, with 50 chapters and lots of of stories and narratives, we won't be able to cover everything, but we're going to, to look through some of those things. And I want to start this morning where Genesis does, in the beginning. Because there is something about the beginning of Genesis that sets the tone, the foundation, for not only everything that follows in Genesis, but everything that follows the rest of Scripture and even ultimately the rest of life, even eternity. There is a foundational element to to the first chapters of Genesis that are not just important, but they are imperative for us to see. Now, as you may well know, there are lots of discussions about what the first couple of chapters of Genesis are saying and what they're doing, and there are all kinds of theories and there are lots of arguments and discussions that people want to get into and they plant their flags in a variety of places. And I'm not really wanting to do that today. What I want to try to do is to think about what did the, what the original author, how did he use what he wrote and the way he wrote it? to speak to an ancient Near Eastern audience. Because I believe that there's a depth of meaning and understanding in that that we might miss if all we're thinking about is using these verses to perhaps prove a theory that we are confident about. So we're going to be thinking about it in those terms because quite frankly, these first couple of chapters are are artistry. There is amazing the way in which God inspires this author to write these words in this way. And I think they speak to us about some important things. And primarily at the heart of what they're saying to us is, who is God? Now in the ancient world, virtually everyone believed in a God. Almost, I would say everyone believed in some kind of deity. The supernatural world was just a part of their lives, probably far more than ours. Everyone, every civilization, every people had a God, and the gods were important to their lives, vital to their lives. And I think what the writer of Genesis is doing is saying, when you think about all those other gods, let me tell you something about Yahweh, about the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob that sets him apart from all those other gods. And it starts with creation. All the other, these other civilizations, they have creation stories. But if you read them, they're very different. And one of the differences is in the creation story is that nature has great power even against the gods. And one of the things that the writer of Genesis is saying right at the beginning is... God controls nature. Nature is under the hand of God. And so you see nature submitting to God. God says, let the water separate, and they do. Let the earth grow, and it does. Let the light appear, and it appears. And you see this this power in God over all of creation that is foundational. There is one God who is over all. 
And that starts at the very beginning of our understanding of who God is. He is the Almighty One, the Creator of all things, the Sustainer of all things, the Ruler of all things. He is God Almighty. But that's not the only picture we get of God. There is also not just that part of Him, but there's also the this, this sense of the nature and the character of God. And you see here that in the, when you think about the way the author rhythms the story, you, you see it, and we couldn't read the whole thing from beginning to end, every word, because it's quite a lengthy passage. And so we designed this, the reading today to, to highlight that rhythm that the, the author has. And one of the rhythms is God said, and it was so. You heard it repeated over and over again. God said, and it was so. God said, and it was so. God said, and it was so. And I think one of the things the author is doing with that is not just the fact that God has power over all that he creates, but also there's an intentionality about the creating of God. In the ancient world, the creation stories, there really is very little intentionality. The earth and, the, and people come into existence either by accident or as a, as a punishment. And when the gods have a war with each other and one of them loses, this is their punishment. That they, the earth is made for them to labor and to, to deal with losing. It's only in the biblical story that you have a sense of God creating intentionally. Because God loves to create. No one is, is forcing God to make what he makes. He chooses to make it. And there is an intentionality about God and loving his creation. And that's why at the end of it, it says it was good. It isn't an accident. It is made by God. And God looks at it and says it is good. And the word good really has the sense of wonderful, delightful, joyful. It is this creative process of, that God has done that he looks at all of creation and says, that's what I'm talking about. I like this. But it's not just good. It's excessively good. God doesn't create and say, well, that's good enough. God creates and says, that's very good. And there is, there is a, an, an almost unnecessary extravagance to the creation of God. Have you noticed that? This is a cartoon that I have here with these guys, you know, Frank and Ernest cartoon. And it says, making all the fingerprints different, I can understand. But doing it for snowflakes seems like busy work. God just goes the extra mile in the creating. A.J. Swoboda tells one day about eating in, a, in a, an Indian restaurant with a friend where they lived in Portland, Oregon. And in the middle of the meal, his friend stopped eating and looked at him and said, A.J., I'm just overwhelmed by the goodness of God. And A.J. said, why right now? He said, because God didn't have to make food this good. There is something about the way God creates that it is so much more than necessary. He didn't have to make the blues so blue and the green so green and the red so red. He didn't have to make all the species of animals and birds and insects. He didn't have to have all the diversity. He didn't have to do all of that. He could have just said, that's good enough, but he doesn't. Because he is a God of extravagant blessing. And you and I can get caught up in the trap of thinking God is minimalist. God is stingy. What is it Jesus says about prayer? He says, when your children ask you for an egg, you wouldn't give them a stone. They ask you for a fish, you wouldn't give them a snake. And if you who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more does your Father in heaven want to give good gifts to you? I think one of the problems we struggle with about God is that somehow we've come to this belief that God is stingy. And he's not, he's extravagant. There is something about the way the writer, again, rhythms this story 
that highlights the six days of creation that I think is, is telling his audience a few things. And we might not see it because we have Western post-enlightenment ways of thinking of things. But I think in the ancient world, these are things that they would have noticed. We think about the six days, and there's a lot of theories about how long it took God to create. And people you know, are all over the map with that. And I'm not, I'm not making a statement about how long or how short. But there is something about the way the story is told that highlights the six days. One of the arguments about, about why it should just be a literal six-day creation is that it doesn't, God could create in a millisecond. He doesn't need millions of years. And that's true. But then that's also true. God doesn't need six days to create if he can create in a millisecond. And really, the, I think the author is not, I think some of her answer asking the wrong question. I don't think the question is, how long does, does it take for God to create? I think the question is, why does it take God so long to create? Why is it described this way? He doesn't need six days to create. God doesn't get to the, to the end of the first day and say, good golly, Miss Molly, I'm spent. I can't do anymore. I've got to stop. No. He could do it like this, but he doesn't. There is something about the way the author describes this, and I think there is something in that of God liking his creation, looking at his creation, observing his creation. You notice it says, and God saw, and it was good. There is a, a, a response to God, of God to his creation, not unlike an artist. And I'm, no one would ever mistake me for an artist, but if, you, if an artist, I've seen artists standing in front of paintings that they've done, and, and you have a hand in the chin in the hand, and you kind of look at it this way, and you kind of look at it this way, and you tilt your head, you get the light just right, and you go, yeah, it's good. That's what I want. That's it. And you almost get a sense that that's what God is doing, because He just enjoys His creation. God saw. And it was good. And the fact that God, that the writer describes this as six days, tells us that God is, wants to connect with his creation. Because the longer it takes for you to do something, the more connected you are to it. And that's just the way it goes. Think about gardening. The longer you, you know, something about doing a garden and nurturing a garden and spending time in a garden that makes the produce that comes from it just better than what you can buy in the store however good what you buy in the store might be. Because you have invested in it, you've connected with it, there's, a, there's that point of the, that this is just so much more important to you. And there is a sense in which God wants to do that. You know, you, I think sometimes we see God as distant and disconnected. God is this being out there and he just sort of gives us edicts. And he tells us what to do. But he's not really personal and connected. And we come to the New Testament and we think, well, okay, Jesus helped God to be personal and connected. No, that started at creation. That God loves his creation. And God wants to be connected to his creation. And God cares about his creation. Which I think is another point of why the writer rhythms it for six days. Because it's not just to highlight the six days, it's also to highlight the seventh day. And God rested. God doesn't need to rest. You have to remember that, that, that this is being written. This is originally written... Some people think Moses wrote it. That's the traditional idea. I would tend to agree with that. Others say maybe it came into written form in the time of the exile when the Israelites come back from Babylon. But either way, this is being given to and written for and taught people who have been slaves. Everything about their existence has been driving them. They don't get days off. In fact, they work them harder. When you read the book of Exodus, you find that the Israelites are being driven harder and harder and harder and harder. 
And the gods of the ancient world drive their, their people harder and harder and harder. One of the words to describe them is demanding. And the writer of Genesis tells us that's not who Yahweh is. In fact, Yahweh builds a day of rest into his creative process. The number seven is a significant number in Scripture and for many of the ancient peoples. There are, there are a number of things here in the first couple of chapters that, ta- that tap into the number seven, like the number of words in, in verse one of chapter one, seven words. There are, there are all these different kinds of ways in which the multiples of seven are woven through the story, and we might look at that and say, well, that's just coincidence. Well, maybe. Maybe it's the author sending subtle messages to an audience that understood those kinds of things far more than we do. But the point of it is, this seventh day is so vital to people who think that God is a slave driver. And the writer of Genesis is saying, God is not like Pharaoh. God is not like Nebuchadnezzar. He's different. You don't exist so that you can meet the needs of God like the other gods of the other nations. You exist in relationship with God. And what God wants from you is that you would be healthy and whole. He wants you to be the very best human beings that you can be. And that means you need time to rest. You need time to step back from the demands. And God is giving, not just giving permission for us to do that, He is demanding that we do that. Because He loves us. Because He wants us to be the best people that we can be. And that time set aside is time not only to rest, but to spend extra time thinking about Him and talking about Him and engaging about Him so that we are nurtured and restored and renewed because that's who God is. And I think the other part of the six days is that John Walton, who is a a Genesis scholar, says that that in the ancient world, he says that for people who are going to build something, that took six days or six stages or six months or something connected to the number six, that everyone around who knew that would look at that and say, what they're building is a temple. And you build a temple as a home for your God. And you bring your God, and your temple is completed, you bring your God, your statue, your representation, your image of your God, and you put it into your temple. And the writer of Genesis says, at the end of the sixth day, God rested because the temple was done. And God, and and the writer says this because God wants to come and dwell among his people, but there's also another nuance to that. Because people who worship a dead God have no problem using dead images to represent him. But people of a living God, have living images. And the writer says, God said, let us make human beings in our own image. That we might, that they would represent me, and God did. Do you know that you were created in the image of God? God. You were created in the image of God. Don't let anybody ever tell you different. Now, have we broken that image? Have we messed it up? Yes, we have. But even then, God is gracious and merciful to send Jesus, the one who dwells among us, and the Holy Spirit to work in us. And what we find happening as the story progresses is that those, that all of creation initially, all human beings were intended to to bear the image of God, but when that got messed up, then God said, I'm not done with you people. 
And so I'm going to choose some who will especially bear my image and I'm going to connect with them. I'm going to partner with them for the very reason of helping everybody else who doesn't realize they're created in the image of God come to see that and understand that and embrace that. And so it starts with Abraham and Israel and the church. And those who understand that we're created in the image of God, those who who embrace that understanding, now become image bearers of God Himself. Imagine the God who puts all things into place says to us, I want to partner with you so that everybody else can know me the way you do. Amazing. But that's the kind of God He is. And it's a great calling. It's a great responsibility. It's also a phenomenal gift and privilege. And you'll notice the language here is about ruling. Rule over the earth. And and sometimes we've interpreted that as, as I can do whatever I want. But not if the purpose is to bear the image of God. If our purpose is to be so transformed by the Spirit into the image of God that we can reflect Him and bear His image to other people, then what matters more than anything than the Spirit transforming us into His image and thinking the way He thinks and acting the way He acts. And when you begin to think of it in those terms, then things like the Sermon on the Mount and the Beatitudes begin to make a lot more sense. And Jesus saying, deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow me. God creates because he loves. And God creates us to transform us, to make us in his image that we would reflect it. I love what C.S. Lewis writes in the Screwtape Letters. You know, that that unique volume in which an archdeacon, archdemon, uh, screw tape, is writing to Wormwood, a demon in training. And he says to him, one must face the fact that all the talk about God's love for humans and, God, and his service being perfect freedom is not mere propaganda, but an appalling truth. He really does want to fill the universe with a lot of loathsome little replicas of himself. Creatures whose life on its miniature scale will be qualitatively like his own. You see, we want cattle who can finally become food. He wants servants who can finally become sons and daughters. God created you and me to be sons and daughters. And our acknowledgement of that, our embracing of that, will make all the difference in our lives. As a response to the word this morning, let me invite you to join me in the prayer of confession. It's printed in your bulletin and also will be on the screens. Let us pray together. O God, your being is love and all your works toward us are mercy. Forgive us when we stray from our confession of faith into thinking that you are like the gods of this world who demand destructive sacrifices in exchange for your favor. Cleanse us from the injustice that goes hand in hand with idolatry. Illumine our minds with the knowledge of who you are, acknowledging you as the source, the giver, whose attitude toward us is one abounding in unfailing generosity and steadfast love. In the name of Jesus Christ, who trusted you through death to new life. Amen. Father,